So my name is Alex Murphy. Um, I was 24 years old when I had my stroke and I'm a professional ice skater. So before I had my stroke, um, I was living a very fortunate life. <laughs> I turned professional as a skater when I was 18 years old and I went on tour with Disney on Ice and then I went on to cruise ships with Royal Caribbean and I was traveling and skating and training and literally living kind of my best life that I ever thought I would ever have. I had been professional at that point for six years and I was kind of hitting the top of what I, the top of what I thought was the best. Um, and then I had my stroke while I was on the ship actually. When I was on the ship, I was skating in an ice show and I had my skates on and I got off the ice and I, oh, it's crazy to talk about it even when I think, say it out loud. <laughs> it's almost easier to write. <laughs> Um, so I got off the ice and I went to take my skates off and it was the end of the cruise. We had 10 days left and we were going from the Canary Islands over to America and I was going to see my family. I had been on the ship for nine months. I was going to see them in 10 days and it was like our second or third to last show. And I got off the ice and I went to untie my skates and I couldn't really do it. And I was like, oh, I must just be cold. Because my foot felt kind of funny. My foot felt like it was numb, like it was tingly, like it had been in my skates for too long. Um, so then I started to take my costume off, got it on the hanger, and then I went to put it on the rack and I couldn't lift my arm to put the costume on the rack. I looked into the mirror and I had absolutely no idea who I was and zero recognition for what I was doing, who I was, who was that person staring back at me. And my, at this point, my entire right hand was gone. I couldn't feel anything. So I started to bang it against um, the sink. One of the bigger boys, he opened the door and he said, Allie, like, what's going on? And I looked at him and instantly I just like collapsed down. I just fell down. And I think the worst, like scariest, strangest part about all of it is I remember absolutely everything. Um, I couldn't communicate or tell him I can't feel my hand, I don't know who I am. But I was able to say, or I was able to like motion to him, something's bad. So he picked me up, he was this really, really big guy and he picked me up and he put me in a chair and everybody panicked. So the whole ice cast was freaking out. <laughs> I think the scariest part was I was seeing everybody's faces. So I didn't realize how bad it was obviously because you can't see outside yourself and there's no mirrors, there's no one showing me if my face is drooping or anything like that, but I'm seeing everyone's reaction to what's going on and I'm unable to tell them anything. And so they gave me a shot of Valium and I woke up um, like three hours later or two, three hours later. Same thing, still hyperventilating, still couldn't speak, nothing. And they came in and one of the nurses at this point, it was probably like seven at night. And one of the nurses came in and said, um, what's your name? And nothing, I like, couldn't react. Um, can, can you write it? She gave me a whiteboard, couldn't write it. Could you, you know, do you know what it letter is? You know, how many numbers? Nothing, like zero, anything at all. And she's like, here's a pen and paper. Can you write down something? So at this point, I still wasn't speaking, but I, I was able to start to draw. So I was scribbling and I knew that they said, what's your name? And I knew that my name started with an A and I knew that it ended with an A and I knew that there was this squiggly thing in the middle that was tall. So I knew it was Alexandra and there was a D in there. So I put an A and then an A and then I drew a line. So I knew that I've always been called Alex. Like I had two halves to my name. And in this room was a private bathroom and there was a sign that said, restroom, uh, please wash your hands. And I just laid there and I was looking at it over and over and over again and like she brought me the drink and then she left and she kept checking in and out and then finally I just screamed, restroom wash your hands, restroom wash your hands over and over and over again until she finally came running in and was like, okay, all right, okay, restroom wash your hands, good, do you want to try again? And then I tried again and then within, I want to say within like an hour of that, things started to come back. So at seven in the morning, they said, okay, we, we need to land you. You need to go to a hospital immediately. And at that point, by seven in the morning, I was speaking sentences. So it, it basically it hadn't even lasted 24 hours that I couldn't fully speak, but I was speaking broken sentences. So I went to the Canary Islands, a hospital in the Canary Islands in Tenerife, and they all spoke Spanish. And I brought one of my skating colleagues along with me and they said, okay, we need to do an MRI immediately. 
And by the time they finished the test, they pulled me out and <laughs> the doctor came in and broken. Spanish English was like, well, good news is it's not a brain tumor. And my friend and I were, you know, I'm 24, she's 26. We were like, what? You know, absolutely not. What do you mean it's a brain tumor? And they said, um, but we need to keep you here. And I said, no, we're going home. Like we're on our way from this, what's part of the world across the, the ocean to go back to Florida. I'm almost home. I have 10 days left. I'm going to be home in 10 days. I'm going home. So they sent me back to the ship. I get some of my things and I get there and, and I tell the medical team what's happening because they said that there was shadowing on my brain. And instantly the medical team then has to call my family because we had postponed it and it's four in the morning there. My parents get a phone call from someone saying Alex has had a situation happen. We, she's fine, she's speaking, she can say hello to you. And I'm on the phone, hi mom, everything's fine. And next thing I knew I packed up over nine months worth of stuff that I had had on a cruise ship and threw it into a bunch of bags. And at two o'clock in the afternoon, the ship took off and they put me in a taxi and they sent me to the Canary Islands in this hospital, this neuro ward. My mom kept talking to me over emails and I mean, it, there wasn't even like really Facebook that, this good. I feel like we couldn't text on Facebook. You had texting. Um, and so she emailed me a lot and we'd talk on the phone like a couple hours a day. And but so I got a lot of practice of almost like reading again from sending emails to my mom. And if I still have the emails, when I look back, they're complete gibberish. It's nothing of, you know, a, no, a normal sentence, but my mom got it. And so she, she just kept saying, send me another email. And it was almost, I think, her way of checking to see if I w was fully reading and writing again, because that's what the doctors had given the symptoms. Well, she's not reading, she's not writing, she's not speaking, but she's moving her body. And I just had that tingling, but I couldn't tell anyone that I had it. So then 10 days after that, they flew me to Miami. The doctor took one look at the tests and said, that shadowing on the brain, that's a stroke, you had a stroke. And at this point, it was 10 days later, so I was like, no, I have it, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. That morning, I had received an email from the Dutch Dancing on Ice, and they said, congratulations, we'd like to welcome you to the cast, um, you've been invited, and these are the dates, um, please sign the contract, we'll see you. And at this point, it was about a month away, and I was like, Oh my gosh, mom, like this is the biggest break. Let's get all these doctor's things over. I don't know, maybe I had a migraine with aura. We were Googling everything. We were self-diagnosing it. And then the doctor said, this is a stroke. You don't realize how serious this is. And then they, then they brought out all the pamphlets that they give to everyone. Like, you've had a stroke. Here's how you deal with it. And nothing applied to me. Like it, it applied to me, yes, but nothing really applied to me. I wasn't handicapped, I was still walking. Yes, I was weak on one side, but I was weak because I was tired. I'm going into these meetings saying, no, I have to do this TV show. So every appointment that I had, I went in and I told them, I just got this TV show, we need to hurry these up because I need to get home to Boston. And finally, one doctor said, listen, she needs these tests done. This is the last test. She needs to do a transesophical echo. We need to draw a little bit more blood. We need to put her to sleep. She needs to have a tube down her throat and we need to find out. And if this is the test, this could be the cause of it all and it could be over before you know it. They put me to sleep and put the, the scope down and they found I had a hole in my heart like the size of a quarter, which is, what is that for you guys? <laughs> Not this big? <laughs> I'm like, like a pea, I don't know how big that is. Good news, we have great news. She has a hole in her heart and we know what the stroke is from and we can fix it. And so we were really, really happy about it. And then I said, great. So I go to this show now in three weeks or a month and let's sort it out when I get back. And they said, well, you have two options. You can be on blood thinners for the rest of your life or you can have this heart surgery um, and it can hopefully heal everything. But if you're on the blood thinners, you probably can't skate anymore because if you get cut, you bleed. You know, you skate around with knives, sharp objects on your feet. And so I was like, well, my mom instantly said, she'll have the surgery, you know. I had my stroke on November 6th. I had heart surgery on November 19th. And on December 15th, I was on the TV show. So it was like the fastest turnaround of my entire life. I was really, really lucky in the sense that things went so fast and my recovery period, you know, I, I had, I put my skates on seven days after my surgery. It didn't go well. It was I was panicked. I hated skating. I didn't want to go anywhere near the ice rink because I was convinced that skating made me have a stroke. 
So that was awful for a while, that getting over that mental, thinking that skating made me sick, even though I was born with a, a heart, you know, a hole. I was born with a hole. My mom gave birth to me and I had it, and then it had nothing to do with the skating. Yeah, I went on to do the TV show after that, and then next thing I knew it was like three months to the day, and then we won. <laughs> so, it's a really, it always ends in a good story, right? It always ends in a positive, but it was really hard for me. The physical part wasn't as hard as the mental part, if that makes sense afterwards. I was in severe denial, and I didn't want anyone to know that I had had a stroke. I was afraid I was gonna lose my job. It's been five years now. It took five years to be able to talk about it and to not pretend like it didn't happen, if that makes sense. When I did the first Dancing on Ice, the Dutch one, um, I was not ready to talk about it. And I, one, I didn't want people to find out, and two, I really, I was afraid of what the companies would say, because I had one company say when they found out that they wouldn't hire me again. Um, and so it was like my little secret. And I also, I wasn't believing it myself. I was like, this is shocking. Can't believe that happened. It was a whirlwind. It happened so fast and the surgery was so fast that it was almost like I just wanted to forget that piece of my life completely. So we did the show. We win the show, it's amazing, and I should be on the biggest high of my entire life, and I was severely depressed. If I look back on it now, obviously not diagnosed depression, because I didn't ever go see anyone, but I think to now how happy I am, and I'm like, that wasn't who I was five years ago. Five years ago, I was scared of everything, and nervous, and uncomfortable in my own skin, and I, like, really cranky, like, really irritable. My mom and dad got tested a year and a half um, they got tested right after I had my stroke because it's, they said, this could be hereditary, let's just check you guys. And they found out that my mom has a hole in her heart. They found out my dad was fine. Everything was gonna be fine. And then a year and a half after my stroke, my mom called me and my dad had had a stroke. And they misdiagnosed him and they found he had a hole in his heart. So he had the surgery and now we're part of the stroke club. And me, my mom, and my dad all have faulty hearts, um, but we're fine. And you know, mom's on aspirin a day, and dad and I are now on just aspirin a day. Um, and he's okay, but I think it was when, it was almost you know a year and a half after my stroke, almost two years after my stroke, when he had his, that I was like, oh my gosh, I had mine, if that makes sense. I, I didn't realize that I had had it, so. Yeah, it was, it, it was really, really emotional, I think, when my dad had his, because I just kept saying, I think he, we related for the first time. My dad, he, I remember him calling me and he was like, you are so badass, Alex. I got offered Dancing on Ice here in the UK, and um, I decided, you know, after five years that I, I could talk about it a little bit more. Every year got easier, but I would say after year three, it was like the three year mark that I kind of was like, okay, this isn't as bad as it as it could be. And so I kind of said, okay, well this year, if anybody asks me about it, I'm just gonna talk about it. And I, I'll just tell people. Cause I had gone to an event and met a girl at an American Heart Association um, event. And she was my age. She was from the same area as me and she was handicapped. And now she's one of my really close friends, Megan. Um, but she, I saw her and I was so sad for everything that happened to her and it made me feel like so grateful, but also, um, I don't know, like guilty that I wasn't hurt. So then I kind of took a while and I thought about it and I was like, if I don't say something, then it's kind of a disservice to people. Cause if I'm lucky enough to be okay, then somebody else is going through what I've been going through for five years and nobody sees it on me. Like I don't have any outside effects, but that was a really crappy time of life. And if there's just one person that wants to reach out to me and talk about it, I'll talk to them about it. I would love to hear their story. So it's been really cool getting to do Dancing on Ice was amazing because not only was the show incredible and it's all these amazing people that you're around, but so many people have reached out to me. The guilt that you feel when you are a survivor and you have nothing wrong on the outside doesn't mean you don't have anything wrong on the inside and it may take five years like it, it took me five years to finally 
talk about this and to sit with you guys and to say, yeah, you know, this is really important. If I choose to go public and tell everybody this was a time in my life that I literally didn't think that one, I'd ever skate again, which maybe it's not important to everyone else, but that's my livelihood. That was my identity. I was one in 10 months when I started skating. I don't know anything but ice skating. I've never had any goals or things I've wanted to achieve more in my life than skating goals. It's always been that. And so when I think of, oh wow, I can just talk to somebody about what they're going through, but maybe their goal is to just, you know, get out of bed today because they still can't move their right arm. And if I can just talk to them about it and they feel better, then I don't have to feel guilty anymore. The, the guilt's going away slowly, if that makes sense, so. I'm talking about it now, but I'm in a bubble talking yeah, about it. it like I feel outside of myself, yeah. yeah. And it takes you, like, I am so fortunate and so unfortunate that I remember everything. Like, like my dad doesn't remember, so when he had his, you know, he didn't lose his speech. His was in the front of his brain. Mine was, you know, back here, but his was in the front and he didn't lose speech. He started to slur his words, um, but he could communicate to my mom. I don't feel good. Like, you know, this something's wrong. Something's wrong. I, I, I can't feel. And he started doing this with his hand. And by the time he got the shot and stuff, he doesn't. I don't think his memory is what mine was because I sat in that cloud for so long. So, and I don't. To be honest, like this is the first time I've actually talked about being in in the cloud, in like my bubble. So that where I can say, yeah, I, I remember all that. You know, all my friends that were there. I remember that Joey was there. I remember that. You know. Liz was there, I remember each and every face of how they reacted to it, and it brings it up no matter what. It's gonna bring it up 30 years from now. I think that patience and persistence, and I've always looked at it, at my recovery as like a goal. Like I said, I set a lot of goals for myself, a little tiny targets that were in my head. So I said, you know, I, I want to run for an hour and run, tell myself I can run 10 miles. and. I set out a goal to do it. I've never done it again, but I did it once because I just wanted to be able to do it. So I think that the best thing to do is to set teeny tiny goals, whether it's I'm gonna walk this lake twice because I can, and I'm gonna set out by the end of the year to be able to walk that twice. But it's, I think a stroke survivor doesn't have that patience and a stroke survivor doesn't have that, um, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like you get really depressed, you get really in yourself. And I think that the best things to do is just wait. Wait, do a lot of reading, do a lot of writing, talk to people about it. I wish I talked to people about it more. Um, I just felt really lonely. I felt like nobody understood what I was going through and then I felt like, like everybody thought that I was faking it, if that made sense, because I didn't look bad. I looked fine, so is everyone thinking, oh, Alex is just playing the stroke card again? And I was like, oh, I'll make humor out of it. But in reality, I was really hurting for years, for a really long time. And I mean, five years now, I'm still emotional about it because it'll never go away. But it can go one of two ways. You can either choose to be miserable and you can choose that you're the victim or you can choose to be happy and you choose to be the survivor. So it's your decision at the end of the day. <laughs> what Different Strokes does is amazing. And I actually have never heard of anything like it until I came here to the UK. So I kind of feel like it was like a gift from God, like a blessing that I was meant to do the UK version of Dancing on Ice and I was meant to meet you people and I was meant to do, you know, to be involved with you guys somehow. Um, I think had I had somebody that either reached out to me or had I had somebody that just made me feel like I was part of, part of the Stroke Club, I think maybe my recovery would have been a little bit faster or a little bit um, smoother because I just felt, and I, I guess lonely is not the word, but just like nobody understood. Nobody was gonna understand what I was going through at the time and nobody was gonna like, give me that little like freedom or that little bit of like leeway to kind of be a brat or to be you know not rude but just irritable and and nasty nobody got it because they didn't know what i was dealing with they didn't know what was going on in my head and so what different strokes does is you get to talk to people and you get to not relive your stroke but you share these stories with people so they're part of your club you're in you're in this little cohesive unit of people that just get each other and that um, yes, their strokes might be different. Yes, they're older. Yes, they're younger. Yes, you know, it, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, there's somebody there to kind of talk to. And if you need that support system, 
someone who's had a stroke, no matter what, will take the time to talk to you about it because they've been there. And it just makes me feel good that I'm lucky enough to have have had a platform this year to have been on, on Dancing on Ice that people are reaching out to me and I, I just want to talk to them about it. Oh, my future, I have so many goals and things that I want to do. Um, I'd love to go back to Dancing on Ice again. I, mean, I don't think I will ever stop skating in some capacity. I always say that skating was the thing that could have killed me, but it was also the thing that saved me. Um, had I not had my stroke on that ship at that time, on the ice, in my skates, um, I would have had it in my sleep or I would have, you know, gotten pregnant years from now and had it during having a baby and I could have died and been handicapped and I wouldn't have been in great shape and I wouldn't have been able to bounce back so quickly. So I have this love for my job and for my sport that like nobody gets. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not obsessed with skating, but I just, I love that feeling. So. I think that I will always keep skating and I would, I just want to keep talking to people about this. I think this is so important and it's not, it's not just an old person's disease. It's not something that you hear that your grandmother had, you know, everybody is affected by this and it's one of the leading causes of death and like it is, I think it's the number one leading cause of paralyzation and, and dehabilitation and I think that, you know, I don't know all my facts about it yet, but the more I, I learn and the more I hear about survivors, the more I just want to get involved and, and talk to people. I think because that, if I had had that a couple years ago, I think that I would still be the same, but I think that it would have happened faster. Would have been a little bit easier. So what you guys do, what, what Different Strokes does is so important.